and so ran this man down there is one very singular thing however how came selden in the darkness to know that the hound was on his trail he heard him to hear a hound upon the moor would not work a hard man like this convict into such a paroxysm of terror that he would risk recapture by screaming wildly for help by his cries he must have run a long way after he knew the animal was on his track how did he know a greater mystery to me is why this hound presuming that all our conjectures are correct i presume nothing well then why this hound should be loose tonight i suppose that it does not always run loose upon the moor stapleton would not let it go unless he had reason to think that sir henry would be there my difficulty is the more formidable of the two for i think that we shall very shortly get an explanation of yours while mine may remain forever a mystery the question now is what shall we do with this poor wretch's body we cannot leave it here to the foxes and the ravens i suggest that we put it in one of the huts until we can communicate with the police exactly i have no doubt that you and i could carry it so far hello watson what's this it's the man himself by all that's wonderful and audacious not a word to show your suspicions not a word or my plans crumble to the ground a figure was approaching us over the moor and i saw the dull red glow of a cigar the moon shone upon him and i could distinguish the dapper shape and jaunty walk of the naturalist he stopped when he saw us and then came on again why dr watson that's not you is it you are the last man that i should have expected to see out on the moor at this time of night but dear me what's this somebody hurt not don't tell me that it is our friend sir henry he hurried past me and stooped over the dead man i heard a sharp intake of his breath and the cigar fell from his fingers who who's this he stammered it is selden the man who escaped from princetown stapleton turned a ghastly face upon us but by a supreme effort he had overcome his amazement and his disappointment he looked sharply from holmes to me dear me what a very shocking affair how did he die he appears to have broken his neck by falling over these rocks my friend and i were strolling on the moor when we heard a cry i heard a cry also that was what brought me out i was uneasy about sir henry why about sir henry in particular i could not help asking because i had suggested that he should come over when he did not come i was surprised and i naturally became alarmed for his safety when i heard cries upon the moor by the way his eyes darted again from my face to holmes's did you hear anything else besides a cry no said holmes did you no what do you mean then oh you know the stories that the peasants tell about a phantom hound and so on it is said to be heard at night upon the moor i was wondering if there were any evidence of such a sound to-night we heard nothing of the kind said i and what is your theory of this poor fellow's death i have no doubt that anxiety and exposure have driven him off his head he has rushed about the moor in a crazy state and eventually fallen over here and broken his neck that seems the most reasonable theory said stapleton and he gave a sigh which i took to indicate his relief what do you think about it mr sherlock holmes my friend bowed his compliments you are quick at identification said he we have been expecting you in these parts since dr watson came down you are in time to see a tragedy yes indeed i have no doubt that my friend's explanation will cover the facts i will take an unpleasant remembrance back to london with me to-morrow oh you return to-morrow that is my intention i hope your visit has cast some light upon these occurrences which have puzzled us holmes shrugged his shoulders one cannot always have the success for which one hopes an investigator needs facts and not legends or rumors it has not been a satisfactory case my friend spoke in his frankest and most unconcerned manner 
stapleton still looked hard at him then he turned to me i would suggest carrying this poor fellow to my house but it would give my sister such a fright that i do not feel justified in doing it i think that if we put something over his face he will be safe until morning and so it was arranged resisting stapleton's offer of hospitality holmes and i set off to baskerville hall leaving the naturalist to return alone looking back we saw the figure moving slowly away over the broad moor and behind him that one black smudge on the silvered slope which showed where the man was lying who had come so horribly to his end end of chapter 12「13. Fixing the Nets " "'We're at close grips at last,' said Holmes, as we walked together across the moor. "'What a nerve the fellow has! How he pulled himself together in the face of what must have been a paralyzing shock when he found that the wrong man had fallen a victim to his plot! I told you in London, Watson, and I tell you now again, that we have never had a foeman more worthy of our steel i'm sorry that he's seen you and so was i at first but there was no getting out of it what effect do you think it will have upon his plans now that he knows you're here it may cause him to be more cautious or it may drive him to desperate measures at once like most clever criminals he may be too confident in his own cleverness and imagine that he has completely deceived us why should we not arrest him at once my dear watson you were born to be a man of action your instinct is always to do something energetic but supposing for argument's sake that we had him arrested tonight what on earth the better off should we be for that we could prove nothing against him there's the devilish cunning of it if he were acting through a human agent we could get some evidence but if we were to drag this great dog to the light of day it would not help us in putting a rope around the neck of its master surely we have a case not a shadow of a one only surmise and conjecture we should be laughed out of court if we came with such a story and such evidence there is sir charles's death found dead without a mark upon him you and i know that he died of sheer fright and we know also what frightened him but how are we to get twelve stolid jurymen to know it what signs are there of a hound where are the marks of the fangs of course we know that a hound does not bite a dead body and that sir charles was dead before ever the brute overtook him but we have to prove all this and we are not in a position to do it well then tonight we are not much better off tonight again there was no direct connection between the hound and the man's death we never saw the hound we heard it but we could not prove that it was running upon this man's trail there is a complete absence of motive no my dear fellow we must reconcile ourselves to the fact that we have no case at present and that it is worth our while to run any risk in order to establish one and how do you propose to do so i have great hopes of what mrs laura lyons may do for us when the position of affairs is made clear to her and i have my own plan as well sufficient for tomorrow is the evil thereof but i hope before the day is past to have the upper hand at last i could draw nothing further from him and he walked lost in thought as far as the baskerville gates are you coming up yes i see no reason for further concealment but one last word watson say nothing of the hound to sir henry let him think that selden's death was as stapleton would have us believe he will have a better nerve for the ordeal which he will have to undergo tomorrow when he's engaged if i remember your reporter right to dine with these people and so am i then you must excuse yourself and he must go alone that will be easily arranged and now if we are too late for dinner i think that we are both ready for our suppers sir henry was more pleased than surprised to see sherlock holmes for he had for some days been expecting that recent events would bring him down from london he did raise his eyebrows however 
when he found that my friend had neither any luggage nor any explanations for its absence between us we soon supplied his wants and then over a belated supper we explained to the baronet as much of our experience as it seemed desirable that he should know but first i had the unpleasant duty of breaking the news to barrymore and his wife to him it may have been an unmitigated relief but she wept bitterly in her apron to all the world he was the man of violence half animal and half demon but to her he has always remained the little wilful boy of her own girlhood the child who had clung to her hand evil indeed is the man who has not one woman to mourn him i've been moping in the house all day since watson went off in the morning said the baronet i guess i should have some credit for i have kept my promise if i hadn't sworn not to go about alone i might have had a more lively evening for i had a message from stapleton asking me over there i have no doubt that you would have had a more lively evening said holmes dryly by the way i don't suppose you appreciate that we have been mourning over you as having broken your neck sir henry opened his eyes how was that this poor wretch was dressed in your clothes i fear your servant who gave them to him may get into trouble with the police that is unlikely there was no mark on any of them as far as i know that's lucky for him in fact it's lucky for all of you since you are all on the wrong side of the law in this matter i am not sure that as a conscientious detective my first duty is not to arrest the whole household watson's reports are most incriminating documents but how about the case asked the baronet have you made anything out of the tangle i don't know that watson and i are much the wiser since we came down i think that i shall be in a position to make the situation rather more clear to you before long it has been an exceedingly difficult and most complicated business there are several points upon which we still want light but it is coming all the same we've had one experience as watson has no doubt told you we heard the hound on the moor so i can swear that it is not all empty superstition i had something to do with dogs when i was out west and i know one when i hear one if you can muzzle that one and put him on a chain i'll be ready to swear you are the greatest detective of all time i think i will muzzle him and chain him all right if you will give me your help whatever you tell me to do i will do very good and i will ask you also to do it blindly without always asking the reason just as you like if you will do this i think the chances are that our little problem will soon be solved i have no doubt he stopped suddenly and stared fixedly up over my head into the air the lamp beat upon his face and so intent was it and so still that it might have been that of a clear-cut classical statue a personification of alertness and expectation what is it we both cried i could see as he looked down that he was repressing some internal emotion his features were still composed but his eyes shone with amused exultation excuse the admiration of a connoisseur said he as he waved his hand towards the line of portraits which covered the opposite wall watson won't allow that i know anything of art but that is mere jealousy because our views upon the subject differ now these are a really very fine series of portraits well i am glad to hear you say so said sir henry glancing with some surprise at my friend i don't pretend to know much about these things and i'd be a better judge of a horse or a steer than of a picture i didn't know that you found time for such things i know what is good when i see it and i see it now that's anella i'll swear that lady in the blue silk over yonder and the stout gentleman with the wig ought to be a reynolds they're all family portraits i presume every one do you know the names barrymore has been coaching me in them and i think i can say my lessons fairly well who is the gentleman with the telescope that is rear admiral baskerville who served under rodney in the west indies the man with the blue coat and the roll of paper is sir william baskerville 
who was the chairman of committees of the house of commons under pitt and this cavalier opposite to me the one with the black velvet and the lace ah you have a right to know about him that is the cause of all the mischief the wicked hugo who started the hound of the baskervilles we're not likely to forget him i gazed with interest and some surprised upon the portrait dear me said holmes he seems a quiet meek-mannered man enough but i dare say that there was a lurking devil in his eyes i had pictured him as a more robust and ruffianly person there's no doubt about the authenticity for the name and the date 1647 are on the back of the canvas holmes said little more but the picture of the old roisterer seemed to have a fascination for him and his eyes were continually fixed upon it during supper it was not until later when sir henry had gone to his room that i was able to follow the trend of his thoughts he led me back into the banqueting hall his bedroom candle in his hand and he held it up against the time-stained portrait on the wall do you see anything there i looked at the broad plumed hat the curling love locks the white lace collar and the straight severe face which was framed between them it was not a brutal countenance but it was prim hard and stern with a firm set thin-lipped mouth and a coldly intolerant eye is it like anyone you know there is something of sir henry about the jaw just a suggestion perhaps but wait an instant he stood upon a chair and holding up the light in his left hand he curved his right arm over the broad hat and round the long ringlets good heavens i cried in amazement the face of stapleton had sprung out of the canvas ha you see it now my eyes have been trained to examine faces and not their trimmings it is the first quality of a criminal investigator that he should see through a disguise but this is marvellous it might be his portrait yes it is an interesting instance of a throwback which appears to be both physical and spiritual a study of family portraits is enough to convert a man to the doctrine of reincarnation the fellow is a baskerville that is evident with designs upon the succession exactly this chance of the picture has supplied us with one of our most obvious missing links we have him watson we have him and i dare swear that before tomorrow night he will be fluttering in our net as helpless as one of his own butterflies a pin a cork and a card and we add him to the baker street collection he burst into one of his rare fits of laughter as he turned away from the picture i've not heard him laugh often and it has always boded ill to somebody i was up betimes in the morning but holmes was afoot earlier still for i saw him as i dressed coming up the drive yes we should have a full day today he remarked and he rubbed his hands with the joy of action the nets are all in place and the drag is about to begin we'll know before the day is out whether we have caught our big lean jawed pike or whether he has got through the meshes have you been on the moor already i have sent a report from grimpen to princetown as to the death of selden i think i can promise that none of you will be troubled in the matter and i have also communicated with my faithful cartwright who would certainly have pined away at the door of my hut as a dog does at his master's grave if i had not set his mind at rest about my safety what is the next move to see sir henry ah here he is good morning holmes said the baronet you look like a general who's planning a battle with his chief of the staff that is the exact situation watson was asking for orders and so do i very good you are engaged as i understand to dine with our friends the stapletons tonight i hope that you'll come also they're very hospitable people and i am sure that they would be very glad to see you i fear that watson and i must go to london to london yes i think that we should be more useful there at the present juncture the baronet's face perceptibly lengthened i hope that you are going to see me through this business the hall and the moor are not very pleasant places when one is alone my dear fellow 
you must trust me implicitly and do exactly what i tell you you can tell your friends that we should have been happy to come with you but that urgent business required us to be in town we hope very soon to return to devonshire will you remember to give them that message if you insist upon it there is no alternative i assure you i saw by the baronet's clouded brow that he was deeply hurt by what he regarded as our desertion when do you desire to go he asked coldly immediately after breakfast we will drive into coombe tracy but watson will leave his things as a pledge that he will come back to you watson you will send a note to stapleton to tell him that you regret that you cannot come i have a good mind to go to london with you said the baronet why should i stay here alone because it is your post of duty because you gave me your word that you would do as you were told and i tell you to stay all right then i'll stay one more direction i wish you to drive to merripit house send back your trap however and let them know that you intend to walk home to walk across the moor yes but that is the very thing which you have so often cautioned me not to do this time you may do it with safety if i had not every confidence in your nerve and courage i would not suggest it but it is essential that you should do it then i will do it and as you value your life do not go across the moor in any direction save along the straight path which leads from merripit house to the grimpen road and is your natural way home i will do just what you say very good i should be glad to get away as soon after breakfast as possible so as to reach london in the afternoon i was much astounded by this program though i remembered that holmes had said to stapleton on the night before that his visit would terminate next day it had not crossed my mind however that he would wish me to go with him nor could i understand how he could both be absent at a moment which he himself declared to be critical there was nothing for it however but implicit obedience so we bade good-bye to our rueful friend and a couple of hours afterwards we were at the station of coombe tracy and had dispatched the trap upon its return journey a small boy was waiting upon the platform any orders sir you will take this train to town cartwright the moment you arrive you will send a wire to sir henry baskerville in my name to say that if he finds the pocket-book which i have dropped he is to send it by registered post to baker street yes sir and ask at the station office if there is a message for me the boy returned with a telegram which holmes handed to me it ran a wire received coming down with unsigned warrant arrive five forty lestrade that is in answer to mine of this morning he is the best of the professionals i think and we may need his assistance now watson i think that we cannot employ our time better than by calling upon your acquaintance mrs laura lyons his plan of campaign was beginning to be evident he would use the baronet in order to convince the stapletons that we were really gone while we should actually return at the instant when we were likely to be needed that telegram from london if mentioned by sir henry to the stapletons must remove the last suspicions from their minds already i seem to see our nets drawing closer around that lean-jawed pike mrs laura lyons was in her office and sherlock holmes opened his interview with a frankness and directness which considerably amazed her i am investigating the circumstances which attended the death of the late sir charles baskerville said he my friend here dr watson has informed me of what you have communicated and also of what you have withheld in connection with that matter what have i withheld she asked defiantly you have confessed that you asked sir charles to be at the gate at ten o'clock we know that that was the place and hour of his death you have withheld what the connection is between these events there is no connection in that case the coincidence must indeed be an extraordinary one but i think that we shall succeed in establishing a connection after all i wish to be perfectly frank with you mrs lyons we regard this case as one of murder 
and the evidence may implicate not only your friend mr stapleton but his wife as well the lady sprang from her chair his wife she cried the fact is no longer a secret the person who has passed for his sister is really his wife mrs lyons had resumed her seat her hands were grasping the arms of her chair and i saw that the pink nails had turned white with the pressure of her grip his wife she said again his wife he is not a married man sherlock holmes shrugged his shoulders prove it to me prove it to me and if you can do so the fierce flash of her eyes said more than any words i have come prepared to do so said holmes drawing several papers from his pocket here is a photograph of the couple taken in york four years ago it is endorsed mr and mrs vandeleur but you will have no difficulty in recognizing him and her also if you know her by sight here are three written descriptions by trustworthy witnesses of mr and mrs vandeleur who at that time kept st oliver's private school read them and see if you can doubt the identity of these people she glanced at them and then looked up at us with the set rigid face of a desperate woman mr holmes she said this man had offered me marriage on condition that i could get a divorce from my husband he has lied to me the villain in every conceivable way not one word of truth has he ever told me and why why i imagined that all was for my own sake but now i see that i was never anything but a tool in his hands why should i preserve faith with him who never kept any with me why should i try to shield him from the consequences of his own wicked acts ask me what you like and there is nothing which i shall hold back one thing i swear to you and that is that when i wrote the letter i never dreamed of any harm to the old gentleman who had been my kindest friend i entirely believe you madam said sherlock holmes the recital of these events must be very painful to you and perhaps it will make it easier if i tell you what occurred and you can check me if i make any material mistake the sending of this letter was suggested to you by stapleton he dictated it i presume that the reason he gave was that you would receive help from sir charles for the legal expenses connected with your divorce exactly and then after you had sent the letter he dissuaded you from keeping the appointment he told me that it would hurt his self-respect that any other man should find the money for such an object and that though he was a poor man himself he would devote his last penny to removing the obstacles which divided us he appears to be a very consistent character and then you heard nothing until you read the reports of the death in the paper no and he made you swear to say nothing about your appointment with sir charles he did he said that the death was a very mysterious one and that i should certainly be suspected if the facts came out he frightened me into remaining silent quite so but you had your suspicions she hesitated and looked down i knew him she said but if he had kept faith with me i should always have done so with him i think that on the whole you have had a fortunate escape said sherlock holmes you have had him in your power and he knew it and yet you are alive you have been walking for some months very near to the edge of a precipice we must wish you good morning now mrs lyons and it is probable that you will very shortly hear from us again our case becomes rounded off and difficulty after difficulty thins away in front of us said holmes as we stood waiting for the arrival of the express from town i shall soon be in the position of being able to put into a single connected narrative one of the most singular and sensational crimes of modern times students of criminology will remember the analogous incidents in godno in little russia in the year 66 and of course there are the anderson murders in north carolina but this case possesses some features which are entirely its own even now we have no clear case against this very wily man but i shall be very much surprised if it is not clear enough before we go to bed this night the london express came roaring to the station and a small wiry bulldog of a man had sprung from a first-class carriage 
we all three shook hands and i saw at once from the reverential way in which lestrade gazed at my companion that he had learned a good deal since the days when they had first worked together i could well remember the scorn which the theories of the reasoner used then to excite in the practical man anything good he asked the biggest thing for years said holmes we have two hours before we need think of starting i think we might employ it in getting some dinner and then lestrade we will take the london fog out of your throat by giving you a breath of the pure night air of dartmoor never been there ah well i don't suppose you will forget your first visit end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen the hound of the baskervilles one of sherlock holmes's defects if indeed one may call it a defect was that he was exceedingly loath to communicate his full plans to any other person until the instant of their fulfilment partly it came no doubt from his own masterful nature which loved to dominate and surprise those who were around him partly also from his professional caution which urged him never to take any chances the result however was very trying for those who were acting as his agents and assistants i had often suffered under it but never more so than during that long drive in the darkness the great ordeal was in front of us at last we were about to make our final effort and yet holmes had said nothing and i could only surmise what his course of action would be my nerves thrilled with anticipation when at last the cold wind upon our faces and the dark void spaces on either side of the narrow road told me that we were back upon the moor once again every stride of the horses and every turn of the wheels was taking us nearer to our supreme adventure our conversation was hampered by the presence of the driver of the hired wagonette so that we were forced to talk on trivial matters when our nerves were tense with emotion and anticipation it was a relief to me after that unnatural restraint when we were at last past franklin's house and knew that we were drawing near to the hall and to the scene of action we did not drive up to the door but got down near the gate of the avenue the wagonette was paid off and ordered to return to coombe tracy forthwith while we started to walk to merripit house are you armed lestrade the little detective smiled as long as i have my trousers i have a hip pocket and as long as i have my hip pocket i have something in it good my friend and i are also ready for emergencies you're mighty close about this affair mr holmes what's the game now a waiting game my word it does not seem a very cheerful place said the detective with a shiver glancing round him at the gloomy slopes of the hill and at the huge lake of fog which lay over the grimpen mire i see the lights of a house ahead of us that is merripit house and the end of our journey i must request you to walk on tiptoe and not talk above a whisper we moved cautiously along the track as if we were bound for the house but holmes halted us when we were about two hundred yards from it this will do said he these rocks upon the right make an admirable screen we're to wait here yes we shall make our little ambush here get into this hollow lestrade you have been inside the house have you not watson can you tell the position of the rooms what are those latticed windows at this end i think they're the kitchen windows and the one beyond which shines so brightly uh, that is certainly the dining room the blinds are up you know the lie of the land best creep forward quietly and see what they are doing but for heaven's sake don't let them know that they are watched i tiptoed down the path and stooped behind the low wall which surrounded the stunted orchard creeping in its shadow i reached a point whence i could look straight through the uncurtained window there were only two men in the room sir henry and stapleton they sat with their profiles toward me on either side of the round table both of them were smoking cigars and coffee and wine were in front of them stapleton was talking with animation 
but the baronet looked pale and distray perhaps the thought of that lonely walk across the ill-omened moor was weighing heavily upon his mind as i watched them stapleton rose and left the room while sir henry filled his glass again and leaned back in his chair puffing at his cigar i heard the creak of a door and the crisp sound of boots upon the gravel the steps passed along the path on the other side of the wall under which i crouched looking over i saw the naturalist pause at the door of an outhouse in the corner of the orchard a key turned in a lock and as he passed in there was a curious scuffling noise from within he was only a minute or so inside and then i heard the key turn once more and he passed me and re-entered the house i saw him rejoin his guest and i crept quietly back to where my companions were waiting to tell them what i had seen you say watson that the lady is not there holmes asked when i had finished my report no where can she be since there is no light in any other room except the kitchen i cannot think where she is i have said that over the great grimpen mire there hung a dense white fog it was drifting slowly in our direction and banked itself up like a wall on that side of us low but thick and well defined the moon shone on it and it looked like a great shimmering ice field with the heads of the distant tors as rocks borne upon its surface holmes's face was turned towards it and he muttered impatiently as he watched its sluggish drift it's moving towards us watson is that serious very serious indeed the one thing upon earth which could have disarranged my plans he can't be very long now it is already ten o'clock our success and even his life may depend upon his coming out before the fog is over the path the night was clear and fine above us the stars shone cold and bright while a half moon bathed the whole scene in a soft uncertain light before us lay the dark bulk of the house its serrated roof and bristling chimneys hard outlined against the silver spangled sky broad bars of golden light from the lower windows stretched across the orchard and the moor one of them was suddenly shut off the servants had left the kitchen there only remained the lamp in the dining room where the two men the murderous host and the unconscious guest still chatted over their cigars every minute that white woolly plain which covered one half of the moor was drifting closer and closer to the house already the first thin wisps of it were curling across the golden square of the lighted window the farther wall of the orchard was already invisible and the trees were standing out of a swirl of a white vapor as we watched it the fog wreaths came crawling round both corners of the house and rolled slowly into one dense bank on which the upper floor and the roof floated like a strange ship upon a shadowy sea holmes struck his hand passionately upon the rock in front of us and stamped his feet in his impatience if he isn't out in a quarter of an hour the path will be covered in half an hour we won't be able to see our hands in front of us shall we move further back upon high ground yes i think it would be as well so as the fog bank flowed onward we fell back before it until we were half a mile from the house and still that dense white sea with the moon silvering its upper edge swept slowly and inexorably on we are going too far said holmes we dare not take the chance of his being overtaken before he can reach us at all costs we must hold our ground where we are he dropped on his knees and clapped his ear to the ground thank god i think that i hear him coming a sound of quick steps broke the silence of the moor crouching among the stones we stared intently at the silver-tipped bank in front of us the steps grew louder and through the fog as through a curtain there stepped the man whom we were awaiting he looked around him in surprise as he emerged into the clear starlit night then he came swiftly along the path passed close to where we lay and went on up the long slope behind us as he walked he glanced continually over either shoulder like a man who is ill at ease 
hist cried holmes and i heard the sharp click of a cocking pistol look out it's coming there was a thin crisp continuous patter from somewhere in the heart of that crawling bank the cloud was within fifty yards of where we lay and we glared at it all three uncertain what horror was about to break from the heart of it i was at holmes's elbow and i glanced for an instant at his face it was pale and exultant his eyes shining brightly in the moonlight but suddenly they started forward in a rigid fixed stare and his lips parted in amazement at the same instant the strad gave a yell of terror and threw himself face downward upon the ground i sprang to my feet my inert hand grasping my pistol my mind paralyzed by the dreadful shape which had sprung out upon us from the shadows of the fog a hound it was an enormous coal-black hound but not such a hound as mortal eyes have ever seen fire burst from its open mouth its eyes glowed with a smouldering glare its muzzle and hackles and dewlap were outlined in flickering flame never in the delirious dream of a disordered brain could anything more savage more appalling more hellish be conceived than that dark form and savage face which broke upon us out of the wall of fog with long bounds the huge black creature was leaping down the track following hard upon the footsteps of our friend so paralyzed were we by the apparition that we allowed him to pass before we had recovered our nerve then holmes and i both fired together and the creature gave a hideous howl which showed that one at least had hit him he did not pause however but bounded onward far away on the path we saw sir henry looking back his face white in the moonlight his hands raised in horror glaring helplessly at the frightful thing which was hunting him down but that cry of pain from the hound had blown all our fears to the winds if he was vulnerable he was mortal and if we could wound him we could kill him never have i seen a man run as holmes ran that night i am reckoned fleet of foot but he outpaced me as much as i outpaced the little professional in front of us as we flew up the track we heard scream after scream from sir henry and the deep roar of the hound i was in time to see the beast spring upon its victim hurl him to the ground and worry at his throat but the next instant holmes had emptied five barrels of his revolver into the creature's flank with a last howl of agony and a vicious snap in the air it rolled upon its back four feet pawing furiously and then fell limp upon its side i stooped panting and pressed my pistol to the dreadful shimmering head but it was useless to press the trigger the giant hound was dead sir henry lay insensible where he had fallen we tore away his collar and holmes breathed a prayer of gratitude when we saw that there was no sign of a wound and that the rescue had been in time already our friend's eyelids shivered and he made a feeble effort to move lestrade thrust his brandy flask between the baronet's teeth and two frightened eyes were looking up at us my god he whispered what was it what in heaven's name was it it's dead whatever it is said holmes we've laid the family ghost once and forever in mere size and strength it was a terrible creature which was lying stretched before us it was not a pure bloodhound and it was not a pure mastiff but it appeared to be a combination of the two gaunt savage and as large as a small lioness even now in the stillness of death the huge jaws seemed to be dripping with a bluish flame and the small deep-set cruel eyes were ringed with fire i placed my hand upon the glowing muzzle and as i held them up my own fingers smouldered and gleamed in the darkness phosphorus i said a cunning preparation of it said holmes sniffing at the dead animal there is no smell which might have interfered with his power of scent we owe you a deep apology sir henry for having exposed you to this fright i was prepared for a hound but not for such a creature as this and the fog gave us little time to receive him 
you have saved my life having first endangered it are you strong enough to stand give me another mouthful of that brandy and i shall be ready for anything so now if you will help me up what do you propose to do to leave you here you are not fit for further adventures tonight if you will wait one or other of us will go back with you to the hall he tried to stagger to his feet but he was still ghastly pale and trembling in every limb we helped him to a rock where he sat shivering with his face buried in his hands we must leave you now said holmes the rest of our work must be done and every moment is of importance we have our case and now we only want our man it's a thousand to one against our finding him at the house he continued as we retraced our steps swiftly down the path those shots must have told him that the game was up we were some distance off and this fog may have deadened them he followed the hound to call him off of that you may be certain no no he's gone by this time but we'll search the house and make sure the front door was open so we rushed in and hurried from room to room to the amazement of a doddering old manservant who met us in the passage there was no light save in the dining room but holmes caught up the lamp and left no corner of the house unexplored no sign could we see of the man whom we were chasing on the upper floor however one of the bedroom doors was locked there's someone in here cried lestrade i can hear movement open this door a faint moaning and rustling came from within holmes struck the door just over the lock with the flat of his foot and it flew open pistol in hand we all three rushed into the room but there was no sign within it of that desperate and defiant villain whom we expected to see instead we were faced by an object so strange and so unexpected that we stood for a moment staring at it in amazement the room had been fashioned into a small museum and the walls were lined by a number of glass-topped cases full of that collection of butterflies and moths the formation of which had been the relaxation of this complex and dangerous man in the centre of this room there was an upright beam which had been placed at some period as a support for the old worm-eaten bulk of timber which spanned the roof to this post a figure was tied so swathed and muffled in the sheets which had been used to secure it that one could not for the moment tell whether it was that of a man or a woman one towel passed round the throat and was secured at the back of the pillar another covered the lower part of the face and over it two dark eyes eyes full of grief and shame and a dreadful questioning stared back at us in a minute we had torn off the gag unswathed the bonds and mrs stapleton sank upon the floor in front of us as her beautiful head fell upon her chest i saw the clear red wheel of a whiplash across her neck the brute cried holmes here lestrade your brandy bottle put her in the chair she has fainted from ill usage and exhaustion she opened her eyes again is he safe she asked has he escaped he cannot escape us madam no no i did not mean my husband sir henry is he safe yes and the hound it is dead she gave a long sigh of satisfaction thank god thank god oh this villain see how he has treated me she shot her arms out from her sleeves and we saw with horror that they were all mottled with bruises but this is nothing nothing it is my mind and soul that he has tortured and defiled i could endure it all ill usage solitude a life of deception everything as long as i could still cling to the hope that i had his love but now i know that in this also i have been his dupe and his tool she broke into a passionate sobbing as she spoke you bear him no good will madam said holmes tell us then where we shall find him if you have ever aided him in evil help us now and so atone there is but one place where he can have fled she answered there is an old tin mine on an island 
in the heart of the mire it was there that he kept his hound and there also he had made preparations so that he might have a refuge that is where he would fly the fog bank lay like white wool against the window holmes held the lamp towards it see said he no one could find his way into the grimpen mire to-night she laughed and clapped her hands her eyes and teeth gleamed with fierce merriment he may find his way in but never out she cried how can he see the guiding ones to-night we planted them together he and i to mark the pathway through the mire oh if i could only have plucked them out to-day then indeed you would have had him at your mercy it was evident to us that all pursuit was in vain until the fog had lifted meanwhile we left lestrade in possession of the house while holmes and i went back with the baronet to baskerville hall the story of the stapletons could no longer be withheld from him but he took the blow bravely when he learned the truth about the woman whom he had loved but the shock of the night's adventures had shattered his nerves and before morning he lay delirious in a high fever under the care of dr mortimer the two of them were destined to travel together round the world before sir henry had become once more the hale hearty man that he had been before he became master of that ill-omened estate and now i come rapidly to the conclusion of this singular narrative in which i have tried to make the reader share those dark fears and vague surmises which cloud our lives so long and ended in so tragic a manner on the morning after the death of the hound the fog had lifted and we were guided by mrs stapleton to the point where they had found a pathway through the bog it helped us to realize the horror of this woman's life when we saw the eagerness and joy with which she laid us on her husband's track we left her standing upon the thin peninsula of firm peaty soil which tapered out into the widespread bog from the end of it a small wand planted here and there showed where the path zigzagged from tuft to tuft of rushes among those green scummed pits and foul quagmires which barred the way to the stranger rank reeds and lush slimy water plants sent an odour of decay and a heavy miasmatic vapour onto our faces while a false step plunged us more than once thigh deep into the dark quivering mire which shook for yards in soft undulations around our feet its tenacious grip plucked at our heels as we walked and when we sank into it it was as if some malignant hand was tugging us down into those obscene depths so grim and purposeful was the clutch in which it held us once only we saw a trace that someone had passed that perilous way before us from amid a tuft of cotton grass which bore it up out of the slime some dark thing was projecting holmes sank to his waist as he stepped from the path to seize it and had we not been there to drag him out he could never have set his foot upon firm land again he held an old black boot in the air myers toronto was printed on the leather inside it is worth a mud bath said he it is our friend sir henry's missing boot thrown here by stapleton in his flight exactly he retained it in his hand after using it to set the hound upon the track he fled when he knew the game was up still clutching it and he hurled it away at this point of his flight we know at least that he came so far in safety but more than that we were never destined to know though there was much which we might surmise there was no chance of finding footsteps in the mire for the rising mud oozed swiftly in upon them but as we at last reached firmer ground beyond the morass we all looked eagerly for them but no slightest sign of them ever met our eyes if the earth told a true story then stapleton never reached that island of refuge towards which he struggled through the fog upon that last night somewhere in the heart of the great grimpen mire down in the foul slime of the huge morass which had sucked him in this cold and cruel-hearted man is forever buried many traces we found of him in the bog girt island where he had hid his savage ally a huge driving wheel and a shaft half filled with rubbish showed the position of an abandoned mine 
beside it were the crumbling remains of the cottages of the miners driven away no doubt by the foul reek of the surrounding swamp in one of these a staple and chain with a quantity of gnawed bones showed where the animal had been confined a skeleton with a tangle of brown hair adhering to it lay among the debris a dog said holmes by jove a curly-haired spaniel poor mortimer will never see his pet again well i do not know that this place contains any secret which we would not already fathomed he could hide his hound but he could not hush its voice and hence came those cries which even in daylight were not pleasant to hear on an emergency he could keep the hound in the outhouse at merry pit but it was always a risk and it was only on the supreme day which he regarded as the end of all his efforts that he dared do it this paste in the tin is no doubt the luminous mixture with which the creature was daubed it was suggested of course by the story of the family hellhound and by the desire to frighten old sir charles to death no wonder the poor devil of a convict ran and screamed even as our friend did and as we ourselves might have done when he saw such a creature bounding through the darkness of the moor upon his track it was a cunning device for apart from the chance of driving your victim to his death what peasant would venture to inquire too closely into such a creature should he get a sight of it as many have done upon the moor i said it in london watson and i say it again now that never yet have we helped to hunt down a more dangerous man than he who is lying yonder he swept his long arm towards the huge mottled expanse of green splotched bog which stretched away until it merged into the russet slopes of the moor end of chapter 14「fifteen, A Retrospection It was the end of November, and Holmes and I sat upon a raw and foggy night on either side of a blazing fire in our sitting-room in Baker Street. Since the tragic upshot of our visit to Devonshire, he had been engaged in two affairs of the utmost importance, in the first of which he had exposed the atrocious conduct of Colonel Upward in connection with the famous card scandal of the Nonpareil Club while in the second he had defended the unfortunate madame montpensier from the charge of murder which hung over her in connection with the death of her stepdaughter mademoiselle carrere the young lady who as it will be remembered was found six months later alive and married in new york my friend was in excellent spirits over the success which had attended a succession of difficult and important cases so that I was able to induce him to discuss the details of the Baskerville mystery. I had waited patiently for the opportunity, for I was aware that he would never permit cases to overlap, and that his clear and logical mind would not be drawn from its present work to dwell upon memories of the past. Sir Henry and Dr. Mortimer were, however, in London on their way to the long voyage which had been recommended for the restoration of his shattered nerves they had called upon us that very afternoon so that it was natural that the subject should come up for discussion the whole course of events said holmes from the point of view of the man who called himself stapleton was simple and direct although to us who had no means in the beginning of knowing the motives of his actions and could only learn part of the facts it all appeared exceedingly complex I have had the advantage of two conversations with Mrs. Stapleton, and the case has now been so entirely cleared up that I am not aware that there is anything which has remained a secret to us. You will find a few notes upon the matter under the heading B in my indexed list of cases. Perhaps you'd kindly give me a sketch of the course of events from memory. Certainly, though I cannot guarantee that I carry all the facts in my mind. Intense mental concentration has a curious way of blotting out what has passed the barrister who has his case at his fingers ends and is able to argue with an expert upon his own subject finds that a week or two of the courts will drive it all out of his head once more so each of my cases displaces the last and mademoiselle carrere has blurred my recollection of baskerville hall tomorrow some other little problem may be submitted to my notice 
which will in turn dispossess the fair French lady and the infamous Upwood. So far as the case of the hound goes, however, I will give you the course of events as nearly as I can, and you will suggest anything which I may have forgotten. My inquiries show beyond all question that the family portrait did not lie, and that this fellow was indeed a Baskerville. He was a son of that Roger Baskerville, the younger brother of Sir Charles, who fled with a sinister reputation to South America, where he was said to have died unmarried. He did, as a matter of fact, marry, and had one child, this fellow, whose real name is the same as his father's. He married Beryl Garcia, one of the beauties of Costa Rica, and having purloined a considerable sum of public money, he changed his name to Vandeleur and fled to England, where he established a school in the east of Yorkshire. His reason for attempting this special line of business was that he had struck up an acquaintance with a consumptive tutor upon the voyage home, and that he had used this man's ability to make the undertaking a success. Fraser, the tutor, died, however, and the school which had begun well sank from disrepute into infamy. The Vandeleurs found it convenient to change their name to Stapleton, and he brought the remains of his fortune, his schemes for the future, and his taste for entomology to the south of England. I learned at the British Museum that he was a recognised authority upon the subject, and that the name of Vandeleur has been permanently attached to a certain moth which he had in his Yorkshire days been the first to describe. We now come to that portion of his life which has proved to be of such intense interest to us. The fellow had evidently made inquiry, and found that only two lives intervened between him and a valuable estate. When he went to Devonshire, his plans were, I believe, exceedingly hazy. But that he meant mischief from the first is evident from the way in which he took his wife with him in the character of his sister. The idea of using her as a decoy was clearly already in his mind, though he may not have been certain how the details of his plot were to be arranged. He meant in the end to have the estate, and he was ready to use any tool or run any risk for that end. His first act was to establish himself as near to his ancestral home as he could, and his second was to cultivate a friendship with Sir Charles Baskerville and with the neighbours. The baronet himself told him about the family hound, and so prepared the way for his own death. Stapleton, as I will continue to call him, knew that the old man's heart was weak and that a shock would kill him. So much he had learned from Dr. Mortimer. He had heard also that Sir Charles was superstitious, and had taken this grim legend very seriously. His ingenious mind instantly suggested a way by which the baronet could be done to death, and yet it would be hardly possible to bring home the guilt to the real murderer. Having conceived the idea, he proceeded to carry it out with considerable finesse. An ordinary schemer would have been content to work with a savage hound. The use of artificial means to make the creature diabolical was a flash of genius upon his part. The dog he brought in London from Ross and Mangles, the dealers in Fulham Road. It was the strongest and most savage in their possession. He brought it down by the North Devon line and walked a great distance over the moor so as to get it home without exciting any remarks. He had already on his insect hunts learned to penetrate the Grimpen Mire, and so had found a safe hiding place for the creature. Here he kenneled it and waited his chance. But it was some time coming. The old gentleman could not be decoyed outside of his grounds at night. Several times Stapleton lurked about with his hound, but without avail. It was during these fruitless quests that he, or rather his ally, was seen by peasants, and that the legend of the demon dog received a new confirmation. He had hoped that his wife might lure Sir Charles to his ruin, but here she proved unexpectedly independent. She would not endeavour to entangle the old gentleman in a sentimental attachment which might deliver him over to his enemy. Threats, and even, I am sorry to say, blows refused to move her. She would have nothing to do with it. 
and for a time stapleton was at a deadlock he found a way out of his difficulties through the chance that sir charles who had conceived a friendship for him made him the minister of his charity in the case of this unfortunate woman mrs laura lyons by representing himself as a single man he acquired complete influence over her and he gave her to understand that in the event of her obtaining a divorce from her husband he would marry her his plans were suddenly brought to a head by his knowledge that sir charles was about to leave the hall on the advice of dr mortimer with whose opinion he himself pretended to coincide he must act at once or his victim might get beyond his power he therefore put pressure upon mrs lyons to write this letter imploring the old man to give her an interview on the evening before his departure for london he then by a specious argument prevented her from going and so had the chance for which he had waited driving back in the evening from coombe tracy he was in time to get his hound to treat it with his infernal paint and to bring the beast round to the gate at which he had reason to expect that he would find the old gentleman waiting the dog incited by his master sprang over the wicket gate and pursued the unfortunate baronet who fled screaming down the yew alley in that gloomy tunnel it must indeed have been a dreadful sight to see that huge black creature with its flaming jaws and blazing eyes bounding after its victim he fell dead at the end of the alley from heart disease and terror the hound had kept upon the grassy border while the baronet had run down the path so that no track but the man's was visible on seeing him lying still the creature had probably approached to sniff at him but finding him dead had turned away again it was then that it left the print which was actually observed by dr mortimer the hound was called off and hurried away to its lair in the grimpen mire and a mystery was left which puzzled the authorities alarmed the countryside and finally brought the case within the scope of our observation so much for the death of sir charles baskerville you perceive the devilish cunning of it for really it would be almost impossible to make a case against the real murderer his only accomplice was one who could never give him away and the grotesque inconceivable nature of the device only served to make it more effective both of the women concerned in the case mrs stapleton and mrs laura lyons were left with a strong suspicion against stapleton mrs stapleton knew that he had designs upon the old man and also of the existence of the hound mrs lyons knew neither of these things but had been impressed by the death occurring at the time of an uncancelled appointment which was only known to him however both of them were under his influence and he had nothing to fear from them the first half of his task was successfully accomplished but the more difficult still remained it is possible that stapleton did not know of the existence of an heir in canada in any case he would very soon learn it from his friend dr mortimer and he was told by the latter all details about the arrival of henry baskerville stapleton's first idea was that this young stranger from canada might possibly be done to death in london without coming down to devonshire at all he distrusted his wife ever since she had refused to help him in laying a trap for the old man and he dared not leave her long out of his sight for fear he should lose his influence over her it was for this reason that he took her to london with him they lodged i find at the mexborough private hotel in craven street which was actually one of those called upon by my agent in search of evidence here he kept his wife imprisoned in her room while he disguised in a beard followed dr mortimer to baker street and afterwards to the station and to the northumberland hotel his wife had some inkling of his plans but she had such a fear of her husband a fear founded upon brutal ill-treatment that she dare not write to warn the man whom she knew to be in danger if the letter should fall into stapleton's hands her own life would not be safe eventually as we know she adopted the expedient of cutting out the words which would form the message and addressing the letter in a disguised hand 
it reached the baronet and gave him the first warning of his danger it was very essential for stapleton to get some article of sir henry's attire so that in case he was driven to use the dog he might always have the means of setting him upon his track with characteristic promptness and audacity he set about this at once and we cannot doubt that the boots or chambermaid of the hotel was well bribed to help him in his design by chance however the first boot which was procured for him was a new one and therefore useless for his purpose he then had it returned and obtained another a most instructive incident since it proved conclusively to my mind that we were dealing with a real hound as no other supposition could explain this anxiety to obtain an old boot and this indifference to a new one the more outre and grotesque an incident is the more carefully it deserves to be examined and the very point which appears to complicate a case is when duly considered and scientifically handled the one which is most likely to elucidate it then we had the visit from our friends next morning shadowed always by stapleton in the cab from his knowledge of our rooms and of my appearance as well as from his general conduct i am inclined to think that stapleton's career of crime has been by no means limited to this single baskerville affair it is suggestive that during the last three years there have been four considerable burglaries in the west country for none of which was any criminal ever arrested the last of these at folkestone court in may was remarkable for the cold-blooded pistoling of the page who surprised the masked and solitary burglar i cannot doubt that stapleton recruited his waning resources in this fashion and that for years he had been a desperate and dangerous man we had an example of his readiness of resource that morning when he got away from us so successfully and also of his audacity in sending back my own name to me through the cabman from that moment he understood that i had taken over the case in london and that therefore there was no chance for him there he returned to dartmoor and awaited the arrival of the baronet one moment said i you have no doubt described the sequence of events correctly but there's one point which you have left unexplained what became of the hound when its master was in london i have given some attention to this matter and it is undoubtedly of importance there can be no question that stapleton had a confidant though it is unlikely that he ever placed himself in his power by sharing all his plans with him there was an old man-servant at merripit house whose name was anthony his connection with the stapletons can be traced for several years as far back as the schoolmastering days so that he must have been aware that his master and mistress were really husband and wife this man has disappeared and has escaped from the country it is suggestive that anthony is not a common name in england while antonio is so in all spanish or spanish american countries the man like mrs stapleton herself spoke good english but with a curious lisping accent i have myself seen this old man cross the grimpen mire by the path which stapleton had marked out it is very probable therefore that in the absence of his master it was he who cared for the hound though he may never have known the purpose for which the beast was used the stapletons then went down to devonshire whither they were soon followed by sir henry and you one word now as to how i stood myself at that time it may possibly recur to your memory that when i examined the paper upon which the printed words were fastened i made a close inspection for the watermark in doing so i held it within a few inches of my eyes and was conscious of a faint smell of the scent known as white jessamine there are seventy-five perfumes which is very necessary that a criminal expert should be able to distinguish from each other and cases have more than once within my own experience depended upon their prompt recognition the scent suggested the presence of a lady and already my thoughts began to turn towards the stapletons thus i had made certain of the hound and had guessed at the criminal before ever we went to the west country it was my game to watch stapleton it was evident however that i could not do this if i were with you 
since he would be keenly on his guard i deceived everybody therefore yourself included and i came down secretly when i was supposed to be in london my hardships were not so great as you imagined though such trifling details must never interfere with the investigation of a case i stayed for the most part at coombe tracy and only used the hut upon the moor when it was necessary to be near the scene of action cartwright had come down with me and in his disguise as a country boy he was of great assistance to me i was dependent upon him for food and clean linen when i was watching stapleton cartwright was frequently watching you so that i was able to keep my hand upon all the strings i have already told you that your reports reached me rapidly being forward instantly from baker street to coombe tracy they were of great service to me and especially that one incidentally truthful piece of biography of stapleton's i was able to establish the identity of the man and the woman and knew at last exactly how i stood the case had been considerably complicated through the incident of the escaped convict and the relations between him and the barrymores this also you cleared up in a very effective way though i had already come to the same conclusions from my own observations by the time that you discovered me upon the moor i had a complete knowledge of the whole business but i had not a case which could go to a jury even stapleton's attempt upon sir henry that night which ended in the death of the unfortunate convict did not help us much in proving murder against our man there seemed to be no alternative but to catch him red-handed and to do so we had to use sir henry alone and apparently unprotected as a bait we did so and at the cost of a severe shock to our client we succeeded in completing our case and driving stapleton to his destruction that sir henry should have been exposed to this is i must confess a reproach to my management of the case but we had no means of foreseeing the terrible and paralyzing spectacle which the beast presented nor could we predict the fog which enabled him to burst upon us at such short notice we succeeded in our object at a cost which both the specialist and dr mortimer assure me will be a temporary one a long journey may enable our friend to recover not only from his shattered nerves but also from his wounded feelings his love for the lady was deep and sincere and to him the saddest part of all this black business was that he should have been deceived by her it only remains to indicate the part which she had played throughout there can be no doubt that stapleton exercised an influence over her which may have been love or may have been fear or very possibly both since they are by no means incompatible emotions it was at least absolutely effective at his command she consented to pass as his sister though he found the limits of his power over her when he endeavoured to make her the direct accessory to murder she was ready to warn sir henry so far as she could without implicating her husband and again and again she tried to do so stapleton himself seems to have been capable of jealousy and when he saw the baronet paying court to the lady even though it was part of his own plan still he could not help interrupting with a passionate outburst which revealed the fiery soul which his self-contained manner so cleverly concealed by encouraging the intimacy he made it certain that sir henry would frequently come to merripit house and that he would sooner or later get the opportunity which he desired on the day of the crisis however his wife turned suddenly against him she had learned something of the death of the convict and she knew that the hound was being kept in the outhouse on the evening that sir henry was coming to dinner she taxed her husband with his intended crime and a furious scene followed in which he showed her for the first time that she had a rival in his love her fidelity turned in an instant to bitter hatred and he saw that she would betray him he tied her up therefore that she might have no chance of warning sir henry and he hoped no doubt that when the whole countryside put down the baronet's death to the curse of his family as they certainly would do he could win his wife back to accept an accomplished fact 
and to keep silent upon what she knew in this i fancy that in any case he made a miscalculation and that if we had not been there his doom would none the less have been sealed a woman of spanish blood does not condone such an injury so lightly and now my dear watson without referring to my notes i cannot give you a more detailed account of this curious case i do not know that anything essential has been left unexplained he could not hope to frighten sir henry to death as he had done the old uncle with his bogey hound the beast was savage and half starved if its appearance did not frighten its victim to death at least it would paralyze the resistance which might be offered no doubt there only remains one difficulty if stapleton came into the succession how could he explain the fact that he the heir had been living unannounced under another name so close to the property how could he claim it without causing suspicion and inquiry it is a formidable difficulty and i fear that you ask too much when you expect me to solve it the past and the present are within the field of my inquiry but what a man may do in the future is a hard question to answer mrs stapleton has heard her husband discuss the problem on several occasions there were three possible courses he might claim the property from south america establish his identity before the british authorities there and so obtain the fortune without ever coming to england at all or he might adopt an elaborate disguise during the short time that he need be in london or again he might furnish an accomplice with the proofs and papers putting him in as heir and retaining a claim upon some proportion of his income we cannot doubt from what we know of him that he would have found some way out of the difficulty and now my dear watson we have had some weeks of severe work and for one evening i think we may turn our thoughts into more pleasant channels i have a box for les huguenots have you heard the Diretskis? might i trouble you then to be ready in half an hour and we can stop at marcini's for a little dinner on the way end of chapter 15 and the end of the hound of the baskervilles by sir arthur conan doyle